Hello everyone and welcome to our third video from the Distance Learning Playbook study where we are going to share some highlights with you from the topics we covered in October and give you a preview of what to expect in November. We want to thank everyone that was able to join us for one of our two October synchronous meetings and we hope that you were able to take away some inspiration and ideas from those sessions. If you were unable to join us for one of those October meetings, please know that the recorded version of it is linked in the Google Classroom under general resources in your distance learning playbook study plan. So during the month of October, we have been learning about building strong relationships with students in the distance learning environment, as well as teacher credibility and increasing clarity through learning intentions and success criteria. So for today's video, the two success criteria we have are one that you can make connections from what you read or to what you have heard in the previous synchronous sessions to our provided topics from the second month's topics. And our second success criterion is that you can explain the expectations for completing the third month's topics in Google Classroom. So let's take a look at that first success criteria and making some connections. So when we start from the highlights of module three, we have to acknowledge the significant role that teacher student relationships play in distance learning. From our text, we know that the relationship between the student and teacher really underpins many of the mind frames that exist in both virtual and face to face classrooms. When those relationships are positive and students know we care about them in their learning, John Hattie's research suggests that students learn more and perform better in the classroom. The unfortunate flip side to that positive student teacher relationship is illustrated here in John Hattie's meta analyses in that when students do not feel liked by their teacher, the result then becomes a negative effect size, meaning student achievement is negatively impacted and student learning is then stifled. So then how can we as educators be mindful of building those positive student teacher relationships? The text really points to five characteristics to consider in distance learning. So teacher empathy, unconditional personal regard, genuineness, non-directivity, and encouraging critical thinking. It really gives us some thought provoking questions to reflect upon when planning for distance learning. By intentionally planning the questions we ask students, the tasks we give them, how we use our time with them, and the responses we give them, whether they're verbal or nonverbal, we can show students that we care about them as people and we care about their learning. We want students to know we care enough about them to listen to what they are saying while really pushing their thinking to new and deeper levels. And this intentionality can also send a clear message to students indicating if you are being sincere in what you say and do, and whether you think they're capable of doing what you ask. And page 51 in the text really reiterates these questions and really helps you to personalize these five characteristics for students. So in thinking about the negative effect size of students who feel disliked, it becomes increasingly more important that in the distance learning setting, we don't send students the wrong message. So while we care about and like our students, if we aren't consciously aware of how our communication comes across the computer screen, we can sometimes make students feel as if we don't care or we don't like them simply by failing to plan for how we respond, particularly to our lowest performing students. And so I really like this reminder of what the research on teacher expectations reminds us of here. And that is that we tend to engage less with low performing students and have less positive feedback and interactions with them. Yet these are the very students who most need quite the opposite. And so what can we do to prevent that chilly classroom? We've talked throughout the study about creating touch points with students, those tools and systems that you put in place to really actively monitor the number of positive interactions that you have with each and every one of your students. In the distance learning classroom, we have to think through just what that will look like for various learning platforms by considering 
how we will call on and engage students in the learning, as well as ensuring that we are providing timely and relevant feedback in synchronous and asynchronous sessions for all students. So while everyone's system for calling on and noticing which students have and have not participated may look different from teacher to teacher, the important pieces to keep in mind here are that number one, we have a system in place that is respectful of students and gets their attention before asking them random questions. And then second, that we are modeling the expectations that we have for our students. If we want our students to be active participants in discussion boards, for example, we as educators have to be active participants also. And then module four took a closer look at teacher credibility, and we know that teacher credibility can influence a student's likelihood to learn. Just how much can it influence? Well, we know from Hattie's research as we look at his meta analyses that the effect size of teacher credibility is 1.09. So that is more than two years growth in one year's time when our students see us as being credible. But what do we mean by teacher credibility? The text talked about four components that would help students to see us as being more credible. The first component was about trust. So students seeing us as being trustworthy. So to help with that, we need to make sure we keep our promises. And if for some reason we're not able to, that we take the time to explain why to our students. We need to tell students the truth about their performance. And when we have clear learning goals and success criteria, it makes it easier to tell the student the truth about where they are, based on where they are headed and also what their next steps might be to help reach that intended learning. In our classrooms, we need to make sure that there are no gotchas. So in the distance learning setting, we need to ensure that we're not purposely looking for students to do something wrong. So if a student does do something wrong, yes, we should definitely talk to that student individually. We should work out a plan to help address it. But by and large, our purpose is not to catch them doing something wrong, but rather to make sure that we are picking out those things you're doing right and really lifting those up as examples. And then finally, the text caution does to make sure we examine any negative feelings that we might have about specific students because our students can sense that and it can greatly compromise the trust that we're trying to build within our classrooms. The second component looked at teacher competency. So our students seeing us competent both in the knowledge of our content and how best to teach it. So the text talked about making sure we know our content well, that whatever the content of a lesson or a series of lessons might be, that we have a deep understanding of it and that we know how to help our students arrive at that same understanding. But it did say it's OK if the question arises and we don't know the answer to it. That's OK, but making sure that we have a clear understanding of the content that is necessary for that particular lesson or series of lessons. In addition to not only having that content knowledge with teacher competency, it's also about making sure that we are intentionally and purposefully planning our lessons and delivering them in a way that is organized, cohesive and coherent. So when our students see that there is a logical flow and sequence to a lesson that each piece along the way has a very clear purpose that's tied to the intended learning, it helps the students to be more engaged in that lesson. And then finally, the text cautioned us to be very aware of our nonverbal behaviors. We know how much we can communicate in our body language, and if we're unintentionally communicating negative body language, our students are going to sense that, and again, it can impact the way they view us as being competent or not. The next component was dynamism. So this is all about looking and sounding passionate about our job and what we teach. So the text reminded us that we may need to rekindle our passion for teaching. Most of us never envisioned that this would be the setting in which we would find ourselves with our students um, in this virtual remote world. And so it's important that we remember why it is we went into teaching, that we have that same pas or passion that we did face to face, and that we let our students see that passion and know that we are still passionate about being there with them. 
It also says make sure we consider the relevance of our lessons. When students can see how something is relevant, how the lesson or the content has some personal application, maybe a real life application, or how it's necessary in a learning progression of where they are, it helps the students to be more engaged and motivated to be a part of whatever that lesson might be. And then finally, in terms of dynamism, the text suggested that we seek out colleagues that we trust and have them maybe watch some of our lessons to give us feedback on simply the energy that we have in delivering those lessons and the passion that we bring to the table. And then the final component was about immediacy. How do our students see us in terms of accessibility and relatability? And to help with that, the text suggested that we get to know something personal about each of our students so they can see we're making those connections with them. We're trying to relate to them in a very, um, I think, genuine way. And then along with this idea of immediacy, it talked about the importance of teaching with a sense of urgency. Now, not to the point that we're stressing our students, but to to the point that our students see that we value their learning and we value their time and we're trying to make the most of the time that we have together by making sure everything we're doing has a very clear purpose and so to help with that the text said make sure we start our classes on time and that we use every second of it very wisely so when you look at these four components and you think about the effect size that they can have, it's critically important that we think about each of these components, which may be our natural strengths for us, but which may be areas in which we need to grow to help our students see us as more credible. So just like our students, we know the impact that clarity can have on understanding. For example, when we're driving as adults, but we don't have a map or GPS, we can feel lost or frustrated because we don't know where we are going or how to navigate to get there. The same is true for our students. Students need to know where they are going in their learning and how to get there, as well as knowing the purpose behind their learning. And so teacher clarity is really about the ability to communicate the learning intentions and success criteria such that the teacher and students have a shared understanding of the learning purposes and definitions of mastery. Teacher clarity has a large effect size of 0.75, almost doubling the speed of learning. So when teachers and students are in agreement about what is to be learned and how both of them will know when intended learning has occurred, we save a whole lot of time that would have otherwise been spent floundering around looking for that purpose. The text talks about four practices we can do to ensure that there is increased, increased clarity with students. The first is clarity of organization. So how can we align the tasks, assignments, and activities we give students to our learning intentions and success criteria? The second is clarity of explanation. So making sure that we are delivering content to students that is accurate and relevant to what they need to know, but delivered in a way that students fully understand. Clarity of examples and guided practice. So that's really that gradual release of responsibility model. So intentionally and gradually decreasing the level of support from you in a way that fosters independence for your students. And then finally, clarity of assessment of student learning. So regularly seeking out and acting on feedback from your students to make those responsive changes in your instruction. As mentioned before, we ultimately want students to be self-regulated learners who can be the drivers of their own learning. But to do that, students need to be able to answer three clarity questions. So the first question, what am I learning today? So we use our learning intentions to help them answer that question. The second, why am I learning this? So that's really that purpose or that relevance for students. And then finally, how will I know that I have learned it? So that's the success criteria that are indicators of student learning. So now let's take a closer look at each of those three pieces. To begin this process, we need to really start with the standards. The standards really provide that foundational framework for teachers of what is to be learned. For teachers to have clarity 
around student learning intentions. They must first know the standards they are teaching by understanding the thinking or depth of knowledge that is intended in each standard. And to understand that intended depth of knowledge or depth of the standards often requires us to analyze the standards by breaking them down into big ideas, conceptual understandings, or through a deep analysis of multidimensionality of word meanings. Once you have the standards broken down and sequenced in a unit, then you're ready to start creating your learning intentions. And page 84 in our text really gives you some space to think through that process with a selected grade level or content specific standard. But if you'd like more information on how best to do this using the CAS, check out our Breaking Down the Standards resources on kystandards.org. The next step in the process is creating learning intentions for students, also referred to as learning goals, targets, purpose, or objectives. Learning intentions really communicate to students what we want them to know, understand, and be able to do by the end of a lesson or a series of lessons. The end in mind or destination, so to speak. So really thinking through what is it that I want my students to know and be able to do by the end of the lesson or lesson series, and how do those understanding skills and concepts align to the intended depth of my grade level standards? It's not the activity students are doing, but the intended learning that students are doing that's so important. And finally, success criteria. These are the map of the learning intentions. They describe what evidence students must produce to show they met the learning intentions, and they are the conc concrete measurable basis for feedback and student self-assessment. So really planning intentionally for how you will communicate to students, what your expectations for their, them are along the way, who will communicate that feedback, whether that's from you, from another stu other students, or from a self-assessment, and what instructional tools or resources will be used to model those expectations and communicate feedback. So that could be using a mentor text, using peer examples, um, using uh, work samples or exemplars, or even rubrics, just to name a few. So really thinking about what is my purpose for what I'm asking students to know and be able to do, and which of these assessment tools, structures, or platforms are going to most closely align with that purpose and elicit the evidence I'm looking for. And then finally, the learning intentions and success, success criteria provided here are just a reading and writing example to help you better understand the connection between the learning intentions and possible success criteria. Please note this is just one possible pathway and not comprehensive to obtaining mastery of the standard. There may be other success criteria needed for your students to gain mastery over any given standard, but regardless, both the learning intentions and success criteria should be closely aligned to your specific grade level standards and responsive to the needs of your students. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Misty so she can introduce our November book study topics. But before I do, if you'd like any more information on ensuring teacher clarity, be sure to check out our Clarity for Learning book study under professional learning opportunities on kystandards.org. And so now let's take a closer look at that last success criterion for the video where you can explain the expectations for completing the third month's topic in our Google Classroom. So this is just a snapshot from our learning plan focused in on the month of November. And as you can see, we are going to, going to be focusing in on instruction. So specifically under the purpose, we're going to be learning about increasing student engagement, which we have heard from many of you. That is an area that a lot of us are struggling to figure out in the distance learning setting. We're also going to be taking a closer look at how we can design experiences that impacts student understanding and what are some strategies that can support those experiences. And then you will notice in that second column, the success criteria that go along with each of those learning goals. 
under the watch, read and attend, we want you to make sure you pay attention to the attend, which is where you're going to choose which monthly synchronous meeting opportunity do you want to attend? So in November, your first option is going to be Monday, November 16th from 430 to 530 or your second option is Thursday, November 19th from 5.30 to 6.30. Please note that those are both um, Eastern Standard Time. So choose the one that works best for your schedule where we will really take a deeper dive of you having an opportunity to um, collaborate with colleagues around some of these topics. For our Reflect and Respond in November, you will see that there are four questions. We would like for you to choose two that most resonates and aligns with your current role that you would like to answer. So again, just choose two of the four. And in the Google Classroom, if you remember, you have the option of submitting your response using a Google Doc or by recording the response in Flipgrid. And then finally, we do have some extension resources for you this month. If you would like to go deeper on these particular topics, you will see that we have two resources from Edutopia. The first one is an article that is giving you tips and considerations when designing your LMS, and that's going to tie back to something you're going to read about in module six. The second one is just a short video from Edutopia that's taking a closer look at keeping students engaged in the virtual setting. And then that final resource is an article from Great Schools Partnership that looks at the different types of engagement that we need to consider in the distance learning setting. So thank you all so much for taking the time to watch this video today. As always, if you have any questions or feedback for us, please feel free to reach out to either me or Carrie. You see our emails on the screen and we hope to see everyone in our live synchronous meetings in the month.